So blood, as you probably know, contains blood cells and plasma. So we have blood and it contains plasma. And the plasma is the fluid component of the blood. All the other cells float in the plasma. And plasma is largely water, but it contains proteins, hormones, nutrients, waste products, things that are circulating around the body in the plasma. But as well as plasma, the blood contains cells, blood cells. So there's plasma and there's cells. And there's two types of cells. There's the red blood cells and the white blood cells. So first of all, the red. The red cells are the erythrocytes. Erythro actually means red. And these are well-known cells in anatomy and physiology. They're biconcave discs. They have an area of central pallor, which is a third or less of the diameter of the whole cell. And looked at from the side, we can see why they have an area of central pallor. It's because they're biconcave discs. And these red cells are transporting the oxygen around the body. But what we're particularly interested in the context of the immune system are the white blood cells. So there's red cells and there's white cells. And the white cells are correctly termed the leukocytes. Now, some people do spell it with a K, but the English, traditional English spelling is with the C, leukocytes. The white blood cells. And if there's an increase in the number of white blood cells in the blood, that's called a leukocytosis. So a leukocytosis is an increase in the number of white blood cells. And because the white blood cells are involved in fighting infection, if someone has a leukocytosis, when you look at their blood cells, there's a test called a differential white cell count, where we can count the number of leukocytes. If that's increased, if there's a leukocytosis, then that's an indicator, most commonly, of infection. Because the white blood cells are essential to fight infection. So when there's infection in the body, the body cleverly increases the number of leukocytes. It gives the body a leukocytosis, increased number of white cells, to see off and kill off this infection. Conversely, if there wasn't enough white blood cells, that's, that can be quite a serious condition. That's called a leukopenia and that can give rise to immunodeficiency. People are prone to overwhelming infections if they have a deficiency of these essential white blood cells. So the white cells are the leukocytes. And basically, there's two classifications of the white cells, of the leukocytes. And the first one we're going to think about are the granulocytes. the granulocytes. And these are so called because they have a granular looking cytoplasm under light microscopy. And there's actually three types of granulocytes we're going to consider. The first is basophils. The second is neutrophils. And the third is eosinophils. So these are the three types of granulocytes. So we've said the white cells are the leukocytes. One type of leukocyte is the granulocytes. And there's three types of granulocytes. Basophils, neutrophils and eosinophils. Now, <clears throat> the basophils... The cell has a lobed nucleus joined together. And basophils have very large granules in their cytoplasm. Actually, now we know that they're not really granules. We now know that they're vesicles containing various chemicals. 
Now, there's very few basophils actually present in the blood. But basophils migrate into the tissues where we call them mast cells. And the mast cells are very important in the local inflammatory response. So basophils with very large vesicles or granules. Then we can think about eosinophils. Now the eosinophils also have a lobe nucleus. And again it's joined together. And the eosinophils have medium sized granules in their cytoplasm. And again, we know these aren't granules, we now know they're vesicles containing various chemicals important in immune defence, the eosinophils. And the eosinophils, if there's an increase in the number of eosinophils, that's called an eosinophilia, an increase in the number of eosinophils, eosinophilia. And that can happen in allergic reactions, it can happen when there's chronic inflammation, and it also happens, do you know when else you get an eosinophilia? Allergic reactions, chronic inflammation, what's the other classic condition where you get eosinophils? An increase in eosinophils. Well, it's where you have parasitic, <coughs> parasitic infections. So if you're working in tropical countries and you're getting multicellular parasitic organisms causing infection, an eosinophilia can be the telltale sign of that. So basophils, eosinophils, then neutrophils. Now neutrophils are by far and away the most abundant form of granulocytes in the blood. And the neutrophils have a lobe nucleus of several lobes. It can be three lobes, sometimes it's four lobes. That gives rise to the other name of polymorpho, <coughs> sorry, polymor polymorphonucleosides. Polymorphonuclear sites. Polymorphonuclear sites. And these have relatively small granules in their cytoplasm. And again, we know they're not granules, we know that they are vesicles. And if there's an increased number of neutrophils, that's called a neutrophilia, an increased number of neutrophils in the blood. And you get a neutrophilia particularly with bacterial infections because the neutrophils will migrate to areas where there's bacterial infection they'll start phagocytosing the bacteria so the body needs to produce more so if there's an area of infection that can be detected by some of the cells in that area particularly the macrophages the macrophages will produce cytokines which are chemical messengers these cytokines will go off to the bone marrow. <clears throat> in the bone marrow there are reserves of neutrophils, the polymorphonuclear cell cells, and these will come into the blood. You'll get an increased number of neutrophils in the blood, there'll be a neutrophilia. But the really clever thing is the neutrophils migrate to where the infection is, and you'll find them in the tissues where there's areas of infection, where they'll deal with that bacterial infection. So neutrophilia if there's too many neutrophils, neutropenia if there's not enough neutrophils, neutropenia. And sometimes there's a great reduction, a very significant reduction in the number of neutrophils, and that's often referred to as an agranular cytosis, an agranular cytosis. What that would literally mean is no granular cells, because these are of course granulocytes. And if there's a very significant reduction, an agranulocytosis, that patient's life is at risk from overwhelming bacterial infection because that's what the neutrophils do. They counter bacterial infection. So granulocytes, basophils, neutrophils, eosinophils. The next classification of cells are the agranulocytes. the agranulocytes. Now these are cells which don't have apparent granules in their cytoplasm in light microscopy. In actual fact some of them do, but this is how they were discovered. 
that when the people first looked at them, they said they had no granules in their cytoplasm. With more advanced techniques, we can see some granules, actually. So the agranulocytes. So what sort of cells are we talking about here? Well, first of all, we can mention the uh, thrombocytes. What's the other name for thrombocytes? Do you remember the thrombocytes? The thrombocytes are the platelets vital for the process of blood clotting. They're really cell fragments that are present in the blood, but they're absolutely vital for blood clotting. Other agranulocytes are monocytes. Monocytes. And monocytes are the absolutely vital white blood cell. Well, I suppose they're all vital, really. But the monocytes are particularly important because the monocytes can migrate into the tissues. So the monocytes can migrate into the tissues. And in the tissues, the monocytes will become what we call macrophages, big eaters, macrophages. So monocytes can become macrophages. The monocytes actually in the blood have a, typically a sort of a horseshoe-shaped nucleus, really, a kidney shape, more like a kidney bean-shaped nucleus, it's that kind of shape. But when the monocytes migrate into the tissues, they change their name to macrophages. So in the blood they're called monocytes, in the tissues they're called macrophages. And if there's any bacteria or dead cells in the tissues to eat, these monocytes, which are now macrophages, will eat lots and lots of this necrotic material. They're, they'll eat lots and lots of bacteria and antigenic material in the process of phagocytosis. <clears throat> and they become, can become really big cells, macrophages, big eaters. And monocytes can also give rise to another type of cell called... Dendritic cells. Well, I'm saying that monocytes can give rise to dendritic cells. That's almost certainly true. Almost certainly true. And the dendritic cells are dendrites. Do you know what dendrites are? It's like branch-like processes, isn't it, dendrites? So the dendritic cells have like branch-like processes like this. Coming off the central part here. <coughs> And what these do is they collect antigens and they present the antigens to the lymphocytes. So they're sometimes called an antigen presenting cells, APCs. So these dendritic cells are present in areas like the skin. If they come across an antigen, they will take that antigen in. Then the dendritic cells will migrate to the lymph nodes. In the lymph nodes, the Dendritic cells, the antigen presenting cells, will present this antigen to the lymphocytes and the lymphocytes will then mount a specific immune response. So really these dendritic cells are sometimes described as the link between innate immunity and specific immunity. Innate in that they can pick up a very wide variety of antigens in the skin <clears throat> or wherever they are in the mucous membranes, but then they go off to the lymph nodes communicate with the lymphocytes which mount a highly specific immune response to the particular antigen. So agranulocytes, thrombocytes, monocytes which can become macrophages or dendritic cells. What's the other big classification of agranulocytes in the blood? and also found in the lymphatic tissue. Of course, it's the lymphocytes. Too many lymphocytes would be a lymphocytosis, an increase in the number of lymphocytes in the blood. <clears throat> and this typically occurs if there's a viral infection. So if you find that someone's got a lymphocytosis, when you look at the differential white cell count, it probably means they've got a viral infection. But of course, it's good that you get a lymphocytosis because it's the lymphocytes that combat the viral infections, as well as other things, but they 
largely prime, uh, combat the viral infections. Now, lymphocytes can be divided into two types. They can be big. What do you think the other ones might be? Those are the big lymphocytes or the small lymphocytes. Now, the big lymphocytes are cells with the great name of the natural killer cells. They are the NKs. The NKs. And they have a nucleus and a cytoplasm, as you would expect. And actually, I know we're on the A granular sites, but these have granules <laughs> in their cytoplasm. Because what the NK cells do, the natural killer cells, is they will kill virally infected cells. So if a cell has a virus in it, the natural killer cell will recognise this from viral antigenic fragments on the surface of the infected body cell. <clears throat> and these cells don't mess about, they just kill the whole cell. That's bad because it kills your own cells, but it's also good because all the viruses were inside and they're all killed at the same time. So lymphocytes can be big, which are the NKs, or it can be small. And all the small lymphocytes have a very large nucleus compared to the size of the cytoplasm. They have a large nucleus. So we have small lymphocytes. And the small lymphocytes are one of two types. They can be B lymphocytes, or they can be T lymphocytes. B lymphocytes mature in the bone. T lymphocytes mature in the thymus gland. Now the B lymphocytes, when there's an infection, the particular B lymphocyte will undergo expansion. It's called clonal expansion. You'll get many, many millions of these B lymphocytes. And these B lymphocytes differentiate into an effector cell, a cell that actually does something, something useful, very useful in fact. And these effector cells are called plasma cells. The plasma cells. And the plasma cells have a smaller nucleus, but they have a very large arrangement of endoplasmic reticulum and apparatus to excrete material from the cell because what the plasma cells do is they produce the immunoglobulins. They are the factory for the antibodies. So these are producing lots and lots of absolutely vital antibodies which are Y-shaped molecules. And these antibodies are specific to the particular antigen that the B cell line has been activated against. <clears throat> so the B cells differentiate into plasma cells which produce the antibodies. Absolutely vital to fight the infection. Now the T cells are slightly complicated because there's three types of T cells. There's T helper cells, T suppressor cells, and there's T cytotoxic. T cytotoxic cells. Now again, the number of T cells will increase when there's a particular infection to combat. And the helper cells work because the helper cells stimulate the B cells to produce the antibodies, the immune proteins. So exactly as the name says, the helper cells the T helper cells stimulate the B cells or help the B cells to produce antibodies. And actually, do you know a disease where the T helper cells are particularly affected? What disease primarily kills off T helper cells? Well, that's HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. Human immunodeficiency virus causes acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. AIDS is primarily a disease of the T helper cells. But then we don't want these immune processes to get carried away. So when the particular antigen has been dealt with, when that's been killed off, the T suppressor cells will also stimulate the B cells 
and they'll tell them to stop or limit the immune response. So the T helper cells help the immune response, the suppressor cells limit it and tell it when it's time to stop mounting the immune response. And the T cytotoxic cells work in much the same way <coughs> as the natural killer cells, but they work in a much more specific way. They'll work against virally infected cells and they'll also work against some cancer cells. So just to review the agranulocytes. The agranulocytes, we have thrombocytes and monocytes. The monocytes can differentiate into macrophages or dendritic cells. The other type of agranulocyte is the lymphocytes. Lymphocytes can be big or small. The big lymphocytes are the NKs, the natural killer cells. The small lymphocytes can be B, which differentiate into plasma cells, which are the factory for the antibodies. Or the small lymphocytes can be T, and they can be T helpers, T suppressors, or T cytotoxic cells. So the white cells, the leukocytes, are absolutely vital for the processes of immunity. A deficiency of any one type of white cell will lead to immunodeficiency, potentially overwhelming infection, and of course that can lead to death. So we depend on our white cells all the time to keep us alive.